Well, amen and good morning, church. Hope you are well this morning. I want to extend a special welcome, especially if you are visiting with us this morning. Uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to them, if you haven't already, to uh, the Psalms. We're going to be looking today at Psalm 124 and 125. Uh, if you're using the Pew Bible in front of you, those can be found on page 517. Let me, uh, let me pray for us again, and then we'll begin. Lord, you are indeed our help. We ask, Lord, this morning that you would remind us afresh of the majesty of your rescue. We ask that you would open our eyes anew to your presence with us and your protection of us. Lord, we ask that you would do that in the only way that it can be done by the Holy Spirit's illuminating of our hearts. Use your word to do that, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Well, again, we're going to be in the Psalms this morning. This will be uh, the final Psalm in our yearly trek through the Psalms of this year, unless the schedule gets changed again, um, which it may happen. And uh, we've been going through this. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, interspersed series through the Psalms. Uh, I have been greatly blessed by it and hope to do justice to the other uh, messages that you've heard thus far. Uh, One of the wonderful things about the Psalms is uh, that they're made up of Hebrew poetry. They are poetry of the highest order. And I don't know if you uh, grew up like I did. I didn't grow up reading much poetry. But one of the great things about poetry is that it has an ability to speak transcendently. This morning we're going to be looking at two Psalms. And these Psalms were sung or recited by Jews who were making their pilgrimage yearly to, uh, to worship at the temple. But when we read them, we'll, we'll find that they are uh, evergreen in their resonance. The experience of the Old Testament Jews, though differing in detail, provides a, a preview of what our lives are like as Christians. These two Psalms, we're going to be looking at Psalm 124 and Psalm 125, are two of the 15 psalms known as the the Psalms of Ascent, or the Songs of Ascent. And beginning in Psalm 120 and working systematically through to Psalm 134, these psalms take uh, the, the reader on a pilgrimage journey. If we intently read these psalms, we will find that they they arouse an emotional response to the journey of life. They're read during during a physical ascent towards Jerusalem for the original audience, but, but what they do for us is they, they emote a spiritual ascent. They start in Psalm 120 with the darkness of being far from God, and they work their way through to Psalm 134, to the joy of being in God's presence in God's house. Look up in your Bibles to, to Psalm 120. I want to give you a picture of what these psalms do. Psalm 120, verse 5, woe to me that I sojourn in Meshech, that I dwell among the tents of Kedar. Too long have I had my dwelling place among those who hate peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Woe to me, says the psalmist. Why? Because I dwell far from God's house. I dwell far from God's people. I dwell amongst the warring nations of Meshech and Kedar. Too long, says the psalmist, have I lived among those who hate me and hate my God. Can you, can you feel the longing to be close to God? But if you, if you make your way through the journey, as they would have, as they were reciting these, you can imagine what it would be like to walk up to Jerusalem, to the temple, look to Psalm 134, Beginning in verse 1, come bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. Do you see how we, we begin in Psalm 120 with the darkness and depression of being far from God? And we get to Psalm 134 and we're filled with joy because we're finally at God's house. I would encourage you this afternoon, maybe, to take some time to read straight through these psalms. And you'll see that these pilgrim songs 
are paradigmatic for our lives as Christians. They act, as, they act as a preview of sorts of what our lives are like as followers of Christ. And again, we're going to focus on two of these psalms today, Psalm 124 and 125. And I want to leave you with two main things this morning. Number one, I want to remind you from the psalm that we've been rescued from our enemies. And the second thing I want to remind you of is that we have a secure hope. So let's begin. We've been rescued from our enemies. Look again to, to Psalm 124. A song of Ascents of David. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side when the people rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us alive when their anger, anger was kindled against us. Then the flood would have swept us away. The torrent would have gone over us. Then over us would have gone the raging waters Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Now to the Jew reciting the psalm, especially in the time of post-exile, many enemies would have come to mind. Perhaps you've spent this year reading through the Bible and you've read through the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is littered with God's chosen people running into enemies of various sorts. A revolving door from the Egyptians to the Assyrians to the Babylonians and a multitude of others interspersed. It was a treacherous time for God's people. And in this psalm, they're reminded of just how dangerous their enemies are. Why should their enemies strike fear into them without God? Well, because they could have been wiped out. Two examples. The enemies are like ravenous beasts. They're like raging waters. And what do these two enemies have in common? Well, at the most basic level, these enemies can, can take your life. That's what makes them so terrifying. Ultimately, your enemies are only as frightening as the evil that they can do to you. Or to put it another way, our enemies cause us fear in direct correlation to what they can take from us. The stronger the enemy, the more intense the fear. When I was in my early teenage years, something happened at my home that would forever change the course of my life under my parents' roof. One afternoon, I was outside playing basketball with my younger brother, I'm seven years older than my younger brother, so I always won in these games of basketball, of course. And as we were playing, we, we heard a noise. And because I'm a compassionate person, this sounded like a cry of distress. So I went and got my father, and, and we went under our house. And what we found was a small kitten. A small kitten who was the runt of the litter, who had been left by the rest of the, the, the pack of cats, whatever you call a pack of cats, and they had left this small, little ki- this small little kitten. And this small little kitten would become our family's pet. Now, some of you are thinking, that's a very sweet story. Luke got a childhood best friend that he rescued from under his house. But I regret to inform you that that is not the relationship I had with this cat. I regret to inform you that although I literally saved this cat's life, this cat hated me with a passion that I have not seen an animal hate another human with in the rest of my life. Now, I spent my entire adolescent life going around corners very slowly for fear of being pounced on. I became accustomed to the hiss and bared teeth Whenever my normal life required me to come within a few feet of this animal. And on top of this, as if that wasn't enough, within a few days of this cat coming into our home, we found out that I was extremely allergic. But no, we didn't get rid of the cat. We we got me allergy medicine. And there's no other way to describe my relationship to this cat than to say that, that we were enemies. But here's what's interesting. Although there was mutual animosity between the two of us, we were never really a danger to one another. 
Her existence was more of a nuisance to me, and I was more of a thorn in her side. If things ever got really serious, and thankfully they didn't, but if they ever got really serious, I knew that if push come to shove, I could take this cat. (laughs) And thankfully it never came to that. But my fear for us this morning is that we believe our enemies to be like this house cat. We believe that our enemies are a nuisance for us, that they prevent us from living a comfortable life. We're allowed to be lulled to sleep by the fact that, that we walk past our same enemies day after day after day, and we don't, we don't seem to be in grave danger. And worst of all, we think that we can take on our enemies on our own. But our enemies are not like this house cat. The enemies that we face are like prowling beasts who seek to devour us. These these enemies are not like living in, in my home growing up with this cat. It's more like being dropped into a small cage with a lion. These enemies are like floodwaters. I don't know if you have, like I have, seen videos from the western part of our state over the past several weeks. But there's a video that I couldn't shake out of my mind as I was preparing for this message. And it's a video of a small, a small town in western North Carolina. Businesses and houses lined the left side of the street. A river lined the right side of the street. And now the city doesn't have any houses. It doesn't have any businesses. Because the river has washed away everything that was there. And this is what the enemies of God's people are like. There is no restraining them. There is no controlling them. The reformer Martin Luther put it aptly when he said this, such is the present day church compared to her enemies. Such is each one of us compared to the power of the malignant spirit. Listen to this. We are as a little shrub of recent growth, having no power to hold firm, but he is like a river overflowing with great force, overthrowing all things far and wide. We are like a withered leaf, lightly holding to the tree. He is like the north wind with great force, rooting up and throwing down the trees. How then can we withstand or defend ourselves by our own power? And brothers and sisters, we may not be surrounded by warring nations like the Jews were, but we are surrounded by dangerous enemies My fear is that we might have forgotten that our flesh has not signed a truce truce agreement with us. It's a peacetime mentality that forgets that our enemies, Satan and the demonic realm and the world, would seek not just to swallow up our bodies, but also to swallow our souls. Our enemies would be glad for the floodwaters to sweep us to hell. One of the purposes of this communal song for God's people is to not let them think back on their enemies lightly. We're prone to do that, are we not? It's only a a misremembering nostalgia that would have caused one of the Israelites, after crossing through the Red Sea, after feeling the Egyptians bearing down at their back and being miraculously rescued, it's only a misremembering nostalgia that would, would say this, would that we have, would have died by the hand of the Lord in Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. And it is the same misremembering nostalgia that would cause you and I to believe the trap that our sin is better for us than our communion with God. And is that, is that not what we do every time we sin? Is every sin not a statement that we wish to be back in the bondage that we've been rescued from? But thankfully, we not only have enemies, this text also says that we have a rescue. And friends, we have to rightly understand our enemies if we're going to rightly understand our rescue. Look again back down to the psalm, verse 6. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us his prey to their teeth. We've escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. These psalms were sung or recited on the way to Jerusalem. One can imagine that there would have been some along the way who 
the, 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 the glory of the, their rescue might have lost its luster. Some of them might have indeed settled down into whatever version of normal life that they had. And although they knew the generational stories of God's rescue, one can imagine that some of them along this journey would have been like I find myself some Sundays, merely mumbling along the lyrics of songs dulled in my affection. And perhaps I'm not the only one who's experienced this. Perhaps some of you, even this morning, can relate. But this psalm is meant to be a wake-up call, not only to the reality of the depths of the evil that God's people face, but to the glory of the fact that God was for them. This psalm brings to the forefront of our minds the bondage that we are in, and in so doing, it reminds us of the joy of our bonds being broken. One of the best things for a preacher is when the illustration is given to you in the text because you don't have to come up with one. And we see this in verse 7. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowler. The snare is broken and we have escaped. God's people were like a bird, helplessly trapped. And friends, so were you and I. We were trapped under the reign of the prince of the power of the air. We were bound to our sins and our flesh. We were, as the song that we sang this morning said, sinking, ne'er to rise again, but we have escaped. It's a reality as fallen human beings that our, our memory of the glory of our salvation dulls. We, we drift from the glory of it. We forget the majesty of it. And it's a psalm like this that shakes us out of our lethargy. Think of the bird trapped in the net. It may stretch, it may claw, it may writhe around, but the net will hold firm. Seeing a bird trapped in a net is a pitiful sight. And the reality is, for the bird to be rescued from the net, it must be freed from the outside. The bond has been broken, the psalm says. By who? Not the bird. No, the nets are broken from the outside by God. And indeed, we have had our bonds broken. Did Christ not break the bonds of our sin? Can we not rightly sing the song that we sing sometimes here? My chains are gone. I've been set free. And the question that I hope you're asking yourself is, how do we receive this rescue? How can we be rescued? Well, the answer is in verse 1. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, to receive rescue, you must have the Lord on your side. Your bonds have to be broken by someone who is on your side. And brothers and sisters, what we find in this psalm is that it is the covenant-keeping God, Yahweh, who is on our side. I'd like you, for you to hear something from this psalm this morning. I'd like for you to hear that if you are in Christ and his spirit dwells within you, I want you to hear that the snare of sin that you were once bound in has been broken. And I want to invite you to no longer live bound to that from which Christ has set you free. You used to be in bondage. You used to live in sin. You used to be trapped in the net, but you have escaped. And it's not because you mustered up some Herculean strength to break the bonds of the net. No, you were rescued from the outside because your help is in the name of the Lord, who verse 8 tells us is the one who made heaven and earth. The raging rivers might have washed over you, but your help, help is in the name of God who spoke those rivers into existence. He can break the bows of your enemies. He can calm the waters. The Lord is your help. So we've been rescued from our enemies, but not only that. Secondly, we have a secure hope. Look to Psalm 125, a song of ascents. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people 
from this time forth and forevermore. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, to the righteous lest the righteous stretch, stretch out their hands to do wrong. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good, to those who are upright in their hearts. But those who turn aside to their crooked ways, the Lord will lead away with the evildoers. Peace be upon Israel. We see in these first few verses that these landmarks, Mount Zion, Jerusalem, would have been emblematic of security. The people of God might have been moved into exile, but Mount Zion remained. And as the pilgrim climbed the hill to Jerusalem, they would have been reminded that this path had been traversed by their ancestors before them, and it would be traversed by their ancestors after them. These two landmarks are as secure as it could get. Now, I've had the privilege of serving as a, a pastor for almost a decade now, and one of the things that I find as I have conversations with many of you, and I've had conversations over the years, is that there's an almost universal desire for security. We long for firm footing. We're in the business of fortress building for ourselves. We build up our careers and our health and our families, and our politics, and we hope that when life gets shaky, when the road gets long, when the storms of life come, that these things will help shelter us. Uh, my uh, children, one of the things that they love to do at the beach is as the tide is coming in, they like to build a wall of sand. Okay, now this is not a, an impressive sand castle. It's just a wall of sand. And what they'll do, it's one of the funnest things to watch them do is to build this wall and to see the tide come up and it slowly starts to hit this wall of sand and it kind of keeps coming up and keeps coming up. And there's a moment where you can tell that they realize, uh-oh, this wall is not going to hold against the water. You can kind of see that they think, oh, I should have built this a little bigger. I should have made this wall a little stronger. And then finally, one way will come over and crash over the wall. And they'll say, well, there goes my wall. And friends, the fortresses that we build to protect ourselves are much like this wall of sand. They're washed away by the tides of life. They can't provide the security that we long for. If you allow yourself to trust in anything other than God alone, you will shift with the tide of your idols. As, as one commentator said, some men are like sand, ever shifting and treacherous. Some are like the sea, restless and unsettled. Some are like the wind, uncertain and inconstant. But those who trust in the Lord, they are like mountains, strong and stable and secure. This morning I want to ask, does it feel like your life is shifting under your feet? Could the reason for that be that you've put your faith in something that can't withstand the storms of life. What do you need to have security in this life? Well, you need something that's unchanging. We live in a world that everything we touch is vanity and striving after the wind, the writer of Ecclesiastes says. And the answer to how we find stability and security in this life is that we need to find it in something that's not of this world. We need something over the sun. Namely, we need to do what verse 1 says. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion. And the inverse is true. Those that trust in anything else, they won't have the stability that they want. In life, we not only want stability, but we want protection. Verse 2, as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forevermore. In biblical times, the, the strength of the city would often be correlated to its topography, to sit high and, and lift it up on a mountain, to be surrounded by a mountainous region. That would bring a measure of safety. And this is what the, those who trust in the Lord are like. They're like a secure city. And like the, the terrain surrounding Jerusalem prevented an easy ambush, so the Lord pre prevents us from attack. The Lord is a secure foundation you can build on 
And he is protection that you can depend on. And because he is those things, we have a secure hope. Look down again to verses 3 through 5. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, lest the righteous stretch out their hands to do wrong. Verse 3 would have rung especially true to those who remembered their people being sent into exile. What verse 3 says is that, that evil kings may have a momentary reign over God's place. But that, that rule won't be forever. It will be a restless rule. This was a word of hope to the Jewish people. Their enemies may have a, a moment, but they don't have a future. And friends, the same is true for us. Satan and the evil one, they may, they may run, run amok in this world, but they do so only as far as the leash of God allows. Or to say it another way, as one of the early church fathers was rumored to have said, God acts like a lutenist. And that's one who, who tunes the lute, by the way, if you, if you don't know what a lutenist is. God acts like a lutenist who will not let the strings of his lute be too slack, lest they mar the music nor suffer them to be too hard-stretched or screwed up, lest they break. The scepter of wickedness may reside momentarily on the land allotted to the righteous, but it won't reside permanently on the land allotted to the righteous. And the psalm ends by, by telling us two things. One, verse four, that we can ask God to do good for his people. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good, to those who are upright in their hearts. Let us, brothers and sisters, be constantly asking God to do good to us. Let us ask God to continue to work in the lives of our faith family. Let us ask that the Lord would continue to help us to fight the indwelling sin in our lives. Let us ask God to provide so that we can be in a space where we can all gather together. Let us ask God to to, to, to build relationships, to help us grow in our faith. Do good to us, O oh Lord. And we can do that because we can remember that as verse 5 says, a day of cleansing is coming. But those who turn aside to their crooked ways, the Lord will lead away with the evildoers. Peace be upon Israel. The psalm ends with a stern warning for those who turn away from the ways of the Lord. It's an uncomfortable and unsettling reality that those who who turn aside from God now will one day be led away from God's people on the last day. We have rescue from our enemies. We have a secure hope. But I want to conclude this morning by, by answering the question that you may be asking, how is it that we can say that we share in these things? Well, I'd like to do this by hopefully connecting the sermon that you are hearing now to the sermons that you will be hearing, Lord willing, over the next couple weeks. And I want to make the case that the, that the way that we can know that we've been rescued from our enemies and the way that we can know that we have a secure hope is because we know of the incarnation of Jesus. You see, if, if, if our enemies weren't really as bad as this psalm says they are. If we could have gotten away with a, with a simple step-by-step plan of how to avoid them, if we could have dealt with them like I dealt with my house cat growing up, by just uh, staying away from it enough to not get hurt, if, if, if our enemies were like that, the incarnation wouldn't have been necessary. If our enemies weren't that dangerous, we could have, like most other religions, just been giving up a pathway to reach up to God. A way that we could defeat our our enemies on our own. But see, church, we needed something better than that. What we needed was was God on our side. And how can we know that God is on our side? Well, we can know that he is on our side because he became like us. He became God with us. And he knew that our enemies couldn't be defeated by ourselves. So he became like us in order to defeat them in his life death, and resurrection. And it's the incarnation that makes our rescue possible. Remember, like the bird trapped in the net, we needed rescue from the outside. 
And is this not what Christ did for us in the incarnation? Did he not become what he was not while never ceasing to be what he was? He came to us from the outside, from heaven, so that he might come near to us and to rescue us. And we see this most fully in the crucifixion. When Christ died on the cross, he went to the place that we could not go ourselves in order to break us from the bonds that we could not break ourselves. In his life of perfect obedience, he was never once trapped in the net. Sure, his enemies tempted us. If you read through the Gospels, you'll know that Jesus' ministry was bookended by temptation. And the temptation was this. If you're truly God, rescue yourself. Well, brothers and sisters, God didn't come in Christ to rescue himself. No, he came to rescue us. He did not rescue himself. He laid down his life so that he might be able to rescue us. And if that wasn't glorious enough, he resurrected, proving that he triumphed fully over his enemies. And because he triumphed over his enemies, if we put our trust in him, we can have security. You see, friends, we're now united with Christ, or, or sometimes the scripture will talk about being hidden in Christ. How much more surrounded can you be than being united with someone? How much more surrounded can you be than being hidden in someone? That's how we have security. That's how we have protection because we're hidden in Christ. He does indeed surround us. In Christ, you are as secure as you will ever be because when he ascended, you know what he's doing now? He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, ever making intercession for us. And as far as having a hope, well, if you know your Bibles well, you'll know that Jesus says that he will indeed return. And when he does, he will bring a new Jerusalem where the scepter of the wicked will not only no longer reign, but the scepter of the wicked will no longer reside in the new Jerusalem. Not only will we be freed from the power of our enemies, one day when the new Jerusalem comes, we'll be freed from the presence of our enemies. And that is the hope that we can have in Christ. And in order to have access to all these promises, you indeed have to have the Lord on your side. And there's only one way to have the Lord on your side, and that is by putting your faith in Christ. This morning, I would beg you, if you haven't put your faith in Christ, know that the invitation from Christ is open. This morning, you can walk out of here different than you came in. You can walk in with the Lord on your side. You might have walked in an enemy of God, but you can walk out with the Lord on your side. Put your faith in Christ today. And brothers and sisters, for those of us who are in Christ, let us not grow dull about our rescue. Remember how tight the bonds of sin were so that you remember the freedom of what God has done for you in Christ to rescue you. And may we, like the people of God in the Old Testament, make our way to the new Jerusalem with hope. And let us do that singing that God has rescued us and that he's given us a hope. Let's pray.